On Ticker, this is Import and Export with Lawrence Christophels. Welcome back, everyone. You're watching Import Export here on tickertv.com.au. I'm your host, Lawrence Christophels. Today's show is all about trying to ensure that we're preparing ourselves as best possible and reducing risk as we keep going forward and hopefully emerging sooner rather than later through this COVID-19 crisis. Joining us now from WA is a guy called Daryl Daisley. He's an industry expert for the better part of 30 years and he's a director of, of customs, fuel tax and international trade at Pitcher Partners over there in WA. Hi, Daryl. Thanks for joining us, mate. Hi, oh, Lawrence. Glad to be here. Great. So I want to kick off with um, what are your thoughts? What's your take on how things have gone and where you think they could be heading over the, the next little while? Yeah, look, great question. Um, I think uh, the, the last month has seen a massive shock to supply chains. Mm. Uh, the supply chain has been smashed from a supply side, a demand side. Um, and, you know, the, the federal government's been out there um, trying to provide some additional support to the export sector. Mm. Um, so, you know, traditional business cycles have been heavily impacted and disrupted. So we've certainly had um, a lot of discussions uh, with clients and across um, the practice in Australia um, in terms of, you know, should we be looking at this dilemma um, through a different lens? Yeah. I, I want to touch on the point you just mentioned as well, Daryl, because I saw your article and the, the announcement with uh, the Export Finance Corporation. Uh, Export Finance Australia now, I've got to keep remembering to change the name, and, and, and uh, the department the other day. So what's your take on that? Do you think, obviously, it's a good thing, but does it, will it apply to all the exporters or are there a few people going to fall through the cracks? No, look, I mean, you've got to read the fine print. I mean, another great announcement from government, but, you know, it really is still targeting those reasonably mature exporters you know, yeah. that have been in business for a number of years that are profitable. And really, the export finance um, mechanism is a fallback. Yeah. You know, it's that last stopgap if they're not able to get finance through their traditional means, being, yeah. you know, one of the big four banks, for instance. I guess our thinking has been around the need to strategize as much as you can what, what's currently happening, um, getting an understanding of what goods are moving and which aren't, yeah. and then what support mechanisms are available. And I guess you just mentioned the export finance. Australia is one of those funding support mechanisms. Another critical one is that networking support that could be available you know, mm. through organisations such as yourselves, mm. um, as well as some of the export councils and, and yeah. so on. I wanted to get your opinion. We had Tim Harcourt, as you probably know, a, a few weeks ago on the show, and we, I asked him about the same question, the globalisation, and um, what, what's your take on globalisation going forward? Is it, is it going to be forever change, as we all predict? In the 80s and 90s with the Australian Customs Service, mm. Um, we had high tariff rates. You know, those rates have come down significantly over the last 30 years. Um, and we import a lot. Yeah. Um, and we export, you know, our valuable resources and the like. Mm. But that model I can't see dramatically changing. I, I certainly can see, as most countries can see, the need to potentially manufacture personal protective equipment, yeah. PPE equipment. Mm. But even then, I'd, I'd imagine that's going to be a short window of opportunities for, for those manufacturers because once we get our stock holdings back up, a stockpile yeah. of those particular products, yeah. yet again, we're a small country with a small population. Um, so I'd imagine those stockpiles. One of the things I want to ask, Daryl, is that you know, you've seen so much over your 30 years in international trade. You've been at the, the front line as a, as a customs officer yourself. Is that um, you know this this whole thing around the well? I think the the term that's emerged is supply chain uh, sovereignty around that type of thing, where people want to control that sovereignty back into the country, which have got some great positives. But you know, if you're looking at, we've all been spoiled as consumers. We can go into a major uh, department store and buy a t-shirt for five bucks or ten bucks, and you know. If we're going to start manufacturing, as you say, again in Australia, are consumers prepared to pay the difference for that? Look, and that is is a really, really valid comment. I guess um, uh, some of the assessments and reviews that we've done for clients of late has been around that particular issue. So, you know, they were producers of an article um, that was using a just-in-time model. Yep. So going from a business to a consumer, 
um, with a very efficient supply chain. Mm. So a consumer could order an article. It could be, you know, at their door within two to three days, you know, yeah. coming in from overseas. Um, and that just-in-time model, sadly, when you get such a significant disruption to the supply chain, totally smashes that particular yeah. model. Yeah. There was one in the in the sixties and early seventies that was that, that came out of Japan, which was called Just in Case, Just yeah. in Case Framework, where you had companies holding larger quantities of stock, um, either in the market or very close to the market that they are servicing. Yeah. Now there's an additional there was an additional cost to that, you know, having large stocks of in, inventory, yeah. um, but you had guaranteed you know, supply, um, but it came at a cost. Yeah. I can certainly see that importers um, and even exporters are going to have to consider, are we going to be able to get back into that just-in-time model and, ha- and how soon, as opposed to a just, just-in-case model where, no, I need to now manufacture my article here, I need to get it up into a, a central hub in Asia, for instance, yeah. Singapore, yeah. have a larger quantity of stock holding there um, for a more, well, for a timely delivery up into those other markets. Yeah. And that may be, that will come at an additional cost to the consumer. Absolutely. Australia, as you mentioned, rightly, we've got high labour costs, we've got high property costs, we've got high transport costs. So if we bring all that stuff back in-house from a manufacturing point of view, it, there is a major chalk and cheese comparison between product coming offshore versus domestic product. And there's always going to be a great conversation about quality and national sovereignty and, and manufacturing and jobs. All those things are valid, valid arguments. But when it comes down to consumers you know, go into their pocket to pay for the product, they've got to be the ones who can drive that. Um, so from a supply chain point of view, you know, those those just-in-case models, the, the inventory cover, when, when we used to sort of model supply chains, you look at your forward weeks of cover, your inventory, your order process and triggers, all those things that typically come into play. And as, as you and I'm sure your team are doing, uh, you're, you're working with clients to, to really – just get a blank canvas approach and just start from scratch in many ways. Is that would that be the case, Darren? It is because I guess the landscape's changing so yeah. dramatically, um, and that's why you know we've looked at this phasing aspect of the next um, nine to twelve months to get an understanding of what's occurring in the first three. I'll give you a good example. So, what potentially could happen in the next three to six months? So, if self isolation restrictions are being lifted, yep. that's in our jurisdiction. You know, what's that? What does that mean for cross border trade? Mm. You know, there's a strong likelihood that WA is can, going to have see, see some relaxation in these uh, restrictions yep. sooner than other parts of Australia. But the Premier has certainly come out pretty strongly saying we will still retain our state, state controls and state mm. lockdown. Mm. So, yes, we may open up within the state, um, mm. but physical movement of people, you know, to the eastern states may not occur for some time, yeah. let alone... Um, being able to access, um, you know, that overseas supply chain. Yeah. Well, many, most of that overseas supply chain, a lot of the work that I've done over the years is where you, you typically because of volumes and economies of scale, you bring a lot of cargo into the East Coast and then you know, relocate as a regional dis- distribution centre or another forward stocking location and back into WA. But if these border controls are still in place, the, the border lockouts, maybe you've got to rethink that whole freight model as well and the inventory. you just got to go straight to WA. Oh, look, quite possibly. I mean, one other interesting aspect is um, is that once we do get through this, we're not going to be flicking a switch where suddenly all of our relevant markets are going to come back online at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And conversely, um, are the consumers going to be seeking my goods in that first immediate phase of where things are starting to open up? You know, so there's going to be a real disparity between, well, what type of product am I exporting? Yep. Um, do my consumers want it? Daryl, look, there's so much great more things I want to talk to you about, and I'd love to get you back on the show very regularly because, you know, it, I, I love your, as I said from the outset, your articles, your commentary is really insightful and really up to date. So thanks so much for joining us on this morning's show and getting up extra early over there in WA. Um, really want to look forward to maybe once that, that those um, articles and the, that new paper is about to be released, get back on the show and we'd love to talk about that in more detail with you if that's okay. No, absolutely, Lawrence. I, mean, I, I could talk about this stuff for days. There's just <laughs> so much happening from so many different angles. Fantastic. Thanks, Daryl. Look, um, all the best over there. Stay safe and um, look forward to keeping in touch very soon. Great. Great, Great to be so, part of it. Thank you. Thanks, Daryl. Cheers.